And now we are going to have our speaker of tonight. And this is Professor Durval Costa. Uh, that is the head of nuclear medicine unit here at the Champalimau Clinic. And he has really an extensive curriculum. Uh, he has done work over the last 30 years. He has been in collaborations, not only national, but actually international collaborations. And uh, one of the, I think, very important uh, <coughs> things that he has done is that he was the president of the executive committee of the European Union of Medical Specialists. And uh, he has worked extensively with radio pharmaceuticals. And this is uh, what he's going to tell us about tonight. So welcome, Professor Dorval. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Danielle, for your introduction. Thank you to all of you for being here at our house professional, scientific, clinical, academic, that helps us to develop some of our thoughts and helps us to improve, we hope, the quality of life for patients. Welcome to this house and welcome to this well-organized event for which I want to thank Daniel and Eliard for the invitation and tell you that um, even the smaller events or the smallest of the events are full of problems and therefore we have to thank them for putting together the R that sometimes means things that we don't want to talk about and Maratona da Saúde or Health Marathon although I think that it's not exactly the same thing but I will try to show to you why my interest in radio pharmaceuticals and why some people find very curious that I like, I work, and I try to impose radio pharmaceuticals or their ideas to my colleagues in the clinics and also in the labs. It is well established nowadays that there is a relationship between disease and function. And that relationship is actually an inverse relationship, meaning that the worse the clinical ratings, i.e. the more florid the presentation of the disease, the bigger the functional deficiency. And we usually diagnose disease at this level, where it is florid. Joaquin did show us the example of Parkinson's disease that I will repeat soon. But at that time, the function is almost lost completely. And therefore, we are trying nowadays to come closer and closer with our diagnostic abilities to moments in life, moments in disease, where the function is still not very much damaged, but at a moment where if we have enough knowledge and we can apply that knowledge, we can delay possibly the destruction of the function and therefore improve our patients and the, their quality of life. In order to help us with diagnosis, we have a wide range of techniques and methodologies. Some of them use imaging signals. And my position is just here, nuclear medicine, PET not small animals, but positron emission tomography or single photon emission tomography. The use of radio pharmaceuticals, why? Because the closer we get, the beginning of the deterioration of the function of the cells of some subcellular molecules, the more molecular and metabolic imaging we are doing. And this is actually one of the advantages of the use of radio pharmaceuticals. They give us information on molecular 
and metabolic pathways within the cells and relationship between the, the cells. That's why I like radiopharmaceuticals. And I like them because contrary to what it is done with many structural imaging techniques or methodologies, where in order to enhance the signal, you use milligrams or concentrations in the order of millimolar for doing PET and SPECT with radiopharmaceuticals, you use concentrations which are at least one million times smaller or even more than the one you need to do structural and other functional imaging. And this is, in my point of view, the big advantage of the radiopharmaceuticals. The other one is that the radiopharmaceutical is a compound molecule composed by a biology analog that has got a specific function within the cell or in a subcellular component that labeled with a radionuclide allows us to detect the signal wherever the radiopharmaceutical is throughout its pathway in the organism and help us to understand disease and to understand how disease cells respond to therapies. And to therapies that are specific to certain functions. Joaquin did talk about the importance of dopamine. And we have some radiopharmaceuticals, analogs of dopamine and other molecules close to the pathway, pharmacological pathway of dopamine in the central nervous system that allow us to tell you how those neurons are functioning. But before I enter into that story, let me tell you that the use of radiopharmaceuticals in vivo in diagnosis in the area of oncology has also demonstrated something which is extremely important. The cost savings benefit and efficacy of their use in the diagnose, diagnosis, staging, restaging, and evaluation of response to therapy in several oncological areas is some characteristic that cannot be forgotten. And this is worldwide demonstrating its importance. But the story that I want to tell you is actually a small and a slightly longer becoming shorter story and is part of my life, which is for a long time dedicated to this knowledge of radiopharmacology and radiopharmaceuticals. The first time I started to work on this was in the Faculty of Medicine in Porto when working in the pharmacology department I used some not labeled molecules to find out how denervated myocardium and denervated veins and arteries could respond to several other drugs that we knew were interfering with the neurotransmission. And then when I decided to go into nuclear medicine, I decided to find out how I could improve some of the difficult diagnoses at that time in the clinical arena, which was the differential diagnosis of dementias. And starting in the lab, I could find out that a radiopharmaceutical, which was a naming labeled with technetium 99M, was distributed in the central nervous system in the white and the gray matter exactly the same way as tin microspheres, which were the gold standard to measure cerebral blood flow or brain perfusion. And that allowed me to use this radiopharmaceutical in vivo in humans to differentiate temporal parietal degeneration of the central nervous system, Alzheimer's disease, 
from frontotemporal dementias with accretive values which are worth reporting and paying attention to. And this was a few years ago. But then I decided that there were other things more important. And at that time, brain imaging with radiopharmaceuticals was flourishing because we could indeed get to the help of chemists in our usual multidisciplinary way of working at that time. That continues nowadays to label, as I was saying, some molecules with radionuclides to look at the dopaminergic transmission in the brain. And you know, Joaquin told you nicely, that an English Londoner described a disease just by observation, and he described it nicely in terms of clinical ratings. It so happened that later on, I believe we can say that this disease is actually a wonderful model of disease in men to study. This because it is very well characterized, not only in its clinical presentation, but the knowledge that we have of its neuropathology, neurochemistry, neurofunction, and also there are some therapies nowadays well established in several areas of molecular treatment for Parkinson's disease that can help these patients, unfortunately, cannot delay the progression of disease as yet. And we knew, according to the dopamine hypothesis, that there were some neurons which were producing dopamine, the presynaptic neuron, dopamine that would stimulate some receptors in the postsynaptic neurons to control our movement and some of our cognitive functions. And these cells were lost in patients with Parkinson's disease. We knew it well. It so happened that it was relatively easy to develop a benzamide labeled with iodine 1 to 3 that was specific to the dopamine B2 postsynaptic receptors and therefore could tell us the state in vivo of the availability of these postsynaptic receptors. Later on, we came to understand how we could look at this neuron as well. But before that, the application of the IBZM was able to show us differences in the availability of the dopamine receptors between some neurodegenerative diseases from idiopathic Parkinson's disease where these receptors are still viable, practically normal, and the reason for them to respond well to dopamine agonists like L-DOPA. Unfortunately, if we want to study these receptors, we cannot have the patients under treatment because the treatment blocks the binding of this IBZM to the postsynaptic receptors. And therefore, we could not study these patients in vivo, and we understood immediately that there was another need, i.e., try to label the lack of presynaptic receptors or presynaptic neurons producing dopamine. We know that the dopamine hypothesis is not the only one that explains Parkinson's disease or the degenerative disease called Parkinson's disease and other Parkinsonisms, but we know that the majority of these neurons that come from the substantia nigra into the striatum are the ones that are responsible for the control of our movement and for some of our higher cognitive functions as well. And we know that these neurons, as Joaquin told you a few minutes ago, are the producers of dopamine that are, is released in the striatum to help us. 
And we know that these neurons are destroyed in its origin. They disappear and they cannot produce dopamine. And it seems that these continue to be the most, or one of the most important explanations for the clinical presentation of Parkinson's disease. We knew well that the membrane of these presynaptic neurons has got some molecules that help the dopamine to be transported and saved again inside the neuron. And these molecules or these sites of reuptake are usually blocked by a drug called cocaine. And we thought, why not develop some radiopharmaceuticals similar to cocaine? And that's what we did. And we knew that the amount, the molecular concentrations that we were going to use of these analogs was so small that would be able just to label the site of binding, but not producing any effects. So several were developed and clearly and easily were able to demonstrate in the same patient with Parkinson's disease that there were not enough presynaptic neurons producing dopamine in the striatum more on one hemisphere than on the other one, whilst the postsynaptic receptors were normal. We know that in Parkinson's disease, the disease is in the cellular body within substantia nigra that destroys then the entire axon or the wire into the striatum. And it has been demonstrated that the destruction of these cells is mainly due to the deposition of abnormal proteins that have got a specific formulation, structural formulation, and are called Lewy bodies. And we knew that patients with Parkinson's disease live relatively long. And therefore, if we wanted to compare clinics with imaging presentation and then the necropsy confirmation of the pathology, we could not wait years and years and years for this patient. And therefore, we decided to look into another type of dementia with Parkinson that has got these bodies called Lewy bodies in the cells throughout the cortical gray matter. It is called Lewy body dementia. And that's what we did. And uh, with some surprise for the clinicians working with us at that moment, all the patients, irrespective of their clinical initial diagnosis, that had Lewy bodies throughout the neurons in the cortex, had in life a completely abnormal scan with lack of neurons producing dopamine whilst all the other patients who had an autopsy diagnosis not related to Lewy body were showing an image which was normal. And quickly, you will understand easily how this works. If I show to you images of four patients with a clinical diagnosis of Lewy body dementia that are really abnormal, and the postmortem diagnosis was dementia with some kind of Parkinson, Lewy body dementia. Another one with clinical diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies, one of them also with a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. The distribution of the radio tracer is normal. The amount of presynaptic producing dopamine neurons appears to be preserved and postmortem diagnosis was not a Lewy body disease but Alzheimer's disease which usually has got relative well-preserved presynaptic 
dopamine neurons. And this is easily quantifiable by different observers and different researchers showing, forgive me, showing the diseases with Lewy bodies, clearly with high deficiency of dopamine producing neurons in the striatum against the ones which have not. Destruction of these neurons like the normal controls and patients with Alzheimer's disease. So much so that nowadays we continue to use this in clinics and we use it to separate individuals and confirm in vivo individuals who have dopaminergic degeneration of the nigrostriatal pathway. Forgive me for these pompous words, i.e. patients with destruction of neurons which produce dopamine in the striatum, including idiopathic Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, and other patients that despite some other diseases do have the generation of the nigrostriatal pathway. I, I have Parkinson disease in addition to other diseases. And this is important because this disease here is treated with drugs that block the postsynaptic dopamine D2 receptors and other ones. And they may develop Parkinsonism. And if you want to know if the Parkinsonism that they develop is because they have also Parkinson's disease or they just have Parkinsonism induced by medication, this will help easily. Because they have images and distribution of the neurons producing dopamine, which are similar to individual with essential trauma, normal, individual with Alzheimer's disease with very small destruction of these neurons, if it is at all, and other normal volunteers. I hope that you understand a little bit why I like radio pharmaceuticals, because they are molecules labeled with something that emits a signal, and I can detect that signal wherever the radio pharmaceuticals are. And because they are specific labels for certain functions, that helps me to help my colleagues and patients. And of course, these radio pharmaceuticals help us not only in the diagnosis and the, in this area of neurodegenerative diseases, but if you look into oncology, we have developed radio pharmaceuticals that labeled with a, one radionuclide I use for diagnosis, labeled with another radionuclide that can be used for therapy, either with patients as an outpatient or inpatient. And my last message is this one. Whatever we do, whatever you do in your future, make sure that at the top of your priorities are critical appraisal, quality control, and quality assurance. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Durval, for your talk. Now we have some time for questions from the audience. So please. Uh, thank you for your talk, Professor. Just because you s underlined the point so much, why do some colleagues do not like radio pharmaceuticals? What do they <laughs> don't like in radio pharmaceuticals? Nobody likes radio unless they listen. <laughs> Just. Uh, the thing is that when you compare the use of ionizing radiation with other modalities that do not use ionizing radiation, you have a problem. However, I think that the high and stringent regulations that are applied to our profession and use of these radio pharmaceuticals oblige us to be extremely careful. And we are always under control. 
the amount of ionizing radiation that we use, even in the clinics for diagnosis, uh, let me come back to Joaquin Pinas. Really very small. We know, with no effect. Actually, if you compare the potential damage of radiation, ionizing radiation, I wouldn't say the mobile phone. No, I would say traveling on a motorbike, on a motorway, 100 miles, forgive me, 100 kilometers, or smoking a cigarette for one year, one cigarette a day, the morbidity is higher of this than of the ionizing radiation. Of course, we don't know yet what the real effects of other uses of other signals are in terms of genetic damage. And we know that very high amounts of ionizing radiation evolve genetic damage. We know that. But then, only very high, and the, the, the results that we have to demonstrate those maleficious effects are the ones coming from disasters, not from the usual use. For instance, we know that many years ago, when tinea capitis was treated with radiation, all those kids developing their late life, carcinoma of the thyroid. We know that the incidence of carcinoma of the thyroid and other malignancies have increased dramatically in Ukraine and other countries around Chernobyl. We know that uh, after the disaster in Japan, other damage has been made, but not of the amounts that we use, as I told you, in nano and picomolar concentrations with the amount of radiation that is really, really very small. But if you talk about radio something, if it is not the friends that we listen to in the car or at home, people are a bit worried, I have to say. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to change the pathology to Alzheimer's and ask that since uh, amyloid beta is a well-known biomarker of this disease, if um, you have ever tried using these techniques applied to it, and if so, how well can we predict the development of the disease before any symptoms arise? Thank you. So I presume that you know well that uh, the neuropathology in Alzheimer's disease is mainly due to the deposition of two different molecules, one, one which is a beta amyloid chain and another one which is slightly different, is more related to some molecules called tau of several subtypes. We do have at the moment on the bench, and when I say we, I take it very globally, I don't say here at the moment, uh, some radio pharmaceuticals to look at those two types of neuropathology. We have one which is a derivative of a non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug, which is called FDNP, FDDNP, labeled with carbon 11 or fluor 18 to look at tau more than beta amyloid deposition in the brain. And we have other ones which are so-called uh, Pittsburgh compounds B and several molecules derived from the Pittsburgh compound B labeled with fluor 18 or carbon 11 that look at the deposition of amyloid and are related to the amounts of amyloid. They are not commercially available in Portugal. I do have some experience with one of them that um, I'm not going to say the name of the, of the company that, that has produced it 
but uh, I say the name of the compound is called flute metamol, it's labeled with fluor 18, and I did work with it, not in Portugal. Um, but let me tell you that we will have this Friday a meeting here, and next week another meeting, because there is a company, a pharmaceutical company, developing a new anti-Alzheimer disease medication. And they decided that the best way to save money in their clinical trials, which I think for many years is possibly the right way to do it, is to use assessment of patients before and after the therapy with radiopharmaceutical imaging that in this case is going to be supplied to us by a company that has got um, its manufacturing in Spain. We will be most probably within a few months according to the time that the <coughs> committees of ethics multinational take to understand if it is okay or not to go ahead with this study. We will be using um, markers of the distribution of beta amyloid in the brain to look at patients with Alzheimer's disease. I think that more than Alzheimer's disease, the biggest application of these radio traces will be a little bit earlier, i.e. in patients with, uh, let me call it small memory impairment, um, small cognitive deficiencies. I, I prefer not to call mild because I prefer to call it small <laughs> deficits. I know that we call it mild, but it's small because we don't know what it is. And actually, from my experience with flute metamol, that is transverse across the border for all of them, particularly the beta amyloid ones, if there is an abnormal deposition of the radio tracer, this means that these patients are going to transform or convert into Alzheimer. And if the distribution of the tracer is within normal limits, we are almost sure that these patients will not convert into Alzheimer disease during the expected <coughs> lifetime. So I, I suppose that this will be our main work for the future. But as you know, what is more important? Looking at the beta amyloid deposition or looking at the tau deposition or both? I still don't know and I think that neuropathologists don't know as well and neurologists have some difficulties as yet in understanding what is the best marker. That's why biomarkers are so important. So if there is no more questions, let's thank again Professor Durval. Thank you. Thank you.